Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. It's a delight to be here tonight and on Tu B'Shvat, no less. Let me just start out by saying my good friend Sarah Stein has written a glorious book. And you are in for a treat if you haven't read it yet. I'm, I'm so excited about it. Um, it's a mm -hmm. true feat of historical research brought to us by the most, through the most incredible narrative storytelling. At Stanford, I teach journalism, and I teach about the power of single character narrative. And in this case, you've got, as Stephanie mentioned, this 19th century Jewish patriarch, Saadi Bitsalel Ashkenazi Alevi, who we're going to hear about. He's a character. And then you have another character, which is his entire family mm -hmm. through the generations, right, that you can really focus on. And then it's also the character of Salonika's Jewry, a place that doesn't really exist anymore. And Sarah's going to talk to us about that. And so what we study in journalism is people really can't focus on more than just one. Even when you cover, like, there's 70,000 people died in an earthquake or whatever. You can't, these numbers mean nothing. But when you have this single character, it makes it all the more compelling. And so the story of the, of the Levy family is a microcosm of this incredible Salonika community. Um, from the turn of the century, as we'll hear, really, it was where you really start in the mid 19th Mm -hmm. century, actually, under the Ottoman rule, through the transition to the Greek Christian rule, which we'll learn about, through the Nazi genocide, and now into the present, as they're dispersed around the globe. And as a journalist, I want to say I really I appreciate it so much, Sarah's process, and I want to talk about that tonight as well, how she took these documents disregarded in some cases in dusty suitcases, right, in South Africa and in file cabinets in Rio. And if she hadn't done this, we wouldn't have this story, right? And then it made me think, how many more families are like this that have these dusty papers that we're going to need more Sarah Steins <laughs> to go out and get them? And what's going to happen now that we're all emailing Who's going to write the history of our families, the Sarah Stein of 100 years from now? What archives are they going to find? So I want to talk about all of this. And so the way this is going to work is I'm going to talk, be in conversation with Sarah for about 50 minutes, and she's going to delight us with some very short excerpts throughout our talk from the book to give you a flavor of it. And I hope we're all going to come away with a, an understanding of you know, Greek Jewry, I'm a Greek Jew too, myself. So it was interesting for me. And I was at an event last night at Congregation Beth Jacob, where I belong in Redwood City. And I said, I'm doing this event tomorrow. I can't wait. Sarah Stein, Salonika Jews. And they said, what? Mm. You know, so I thought, Sarah, we would just start with this idea of, you know, by just reading the first couple pages, just the first couple pages, because so many people I meet don't even understand just how enormous and how rich the, the, the community of Salonika was in the mm -hmm. Jewish mosaic of Europe. Lovely. Know? I'd be yeah. happy to. And Janine, yeah. it's so delightful to be in conversation with you. Yeah. And Stephanie, wherever you are, I'm so <laughs> grateful to be here. And thanks to everyone. I thought it would be nice to begin with a, a really short page or so from the beginning of the book to help lay the stage. And then we can proceed to, to dive in deeper. So this is the beginning of the book in a chapter called Writers. This is the story of a single Sephardic family whose roots connect them to a place and community that no longer exist. The place was the port city of Ottoman Salonika, present-day Thessaloniki, Greece, one of the few cities in modern Europe ever to claim a Jewish majority. The community was made up mostly of Ladino, or Judeo-Spanish-speaking Jews, Sephardic families who trace their ancestry back to Sepharad, medieval Iberia, from which they were expelled in the 1490s, but who, for the next five centuries, called the Ottoman Empire, southeastern Europe, and Salonika home. Today, the papers of the Levy family are spread across nine countries and three continents. The single largest collection, the papers of Leon Levy, is kept by his four grandchildren in a private vault in Rio de Janeiro. It consists of nearly 5,000 handwritten and typed letters, telegrams, photographs, legal and medical documents, and miscellany, address books, expired passports, and more. By far the largest private archive I have encountered as a professional historian and near obsessive document hunter. In a suitcase in a spare garage in a retirement village outside Johannesburg, there is another repository of Levy family papers. Smaller than, the Rio, smaller than the Rio collection, the South African one is nonetheless of immeasurable historical import. 
It includes such cherished souvenirs as a silhouette cut in Salonica in 1919, capturing the likeness of a young woman about to emigrate from her native city, never to return. Other family papers have turned up in private hands in England. One collection boxed up in a home in London has survived multiple migrations from Greece to Great Britain, to Germany, to India, back to Great Britain and on to the United States. Another, housed in a scenic village outside Manchester, contains fragile glass slides taken in 1917 in Salonika's Jewish cemetery, then the largest Jewish cemetery in Europe. Yet more documents, photographs, and objects have materialized in Brazil, Canada, France, Germany, Great Britain, Greece, Hungary, Israel, Italy, Portugal, and the United States. Not only family-owned papers, but documents and photographs held by 30 archives travel documents, naturalization papers, birth, death, and medical records, letters exchanged by relatives, lovers, and friends, business papers, even a baptismal certificate. All told, these scattered sources have allowed me to trace an intimate arc of the 20th century. The Levy family papers catalog the lives and losses of multiple generations, contain papers written in eight languages, and reflect correspondence among members of a single family spanning the globe. This is a Jewish story, an Ottoman story, a European story, a Mediterranean story, and a diasporic story. A story of how women, men, and children experienced wars, genocide, and migration, the collapse of old regimes, and the rise of new nations. The Levy family papers also reveal how this family loved and quarreled, struggled and succeeded, clung to one another, and watched the ties that once bound them slip from their grasp. You know, it's just beautiful. And I, um, I'm actually, I've got to pull a question from the end yeah. because you went on sort of a treasure hunt of sorts mm -hmm. that began when you first found his memoir, mm -hmm. Saadi's memoir, the only copy yes, in Ladino it, of exactly. the first published, what is it? The first um, published? I had published some years ago with my former teacher and, and colleague and dear friend, Aaron Rodrigue, a translation of what we understand to be the first memoir written in Judeo-Spanish in Ladino, the language of the Sephardic Jews of Southeastern Europe. And this um, memoir had been handwritten into a very flimsy, inexpensive notebook, um, just the sort of thing you might use if you owned a small business and you needed a ledger, just a cheap uh, um, little paper notebook. And we, we knew that the notebook had made an extraordinary journey of its own. It had been written in the mid to late 19th century this was the only copy that existed. Mm -hmm. And it had somehow managed to weather a century, uh, the collapse of the empire in which it was written, a fire that, that ravaged its city, Salonika, and documents, a, a genocide in the course of which um, Jewish papers were targeted for annihilation as well as Jewish bodies. And it had made its way from Salonika to Paris, to Rio de Janeiro, to Jerusalem. And as we were finishing uh, this project of a translation um, with Isaac, Dr Isaac Drusalmi as translator, I was, my, my parting question was, was how? How had it made this journey and what had happened to the family that came in the wake of this memoirist? And so I began, began a sort of investigatory hunt backwards following um, the path in reverse to figure out how the family itself had made this journey. And that, um, was sort of the, the pulling of a yarn of a sweater that took about a decade to unravel and then, you know, reconstitute into, into this narrative, which led me to, to the various discoveries that I described in, in the piece I just read and many more. And so the journey took you as we've, it's called Family Papers. What was it like to be reading sometimes very often intimate yeah. letters? I mean, any, any historian, I guess, confronts this, right? I mean, did you ever feel, wow, I'm not sure if I should, you know, invasive or this was never meant to be a best-selling, award-winning book? Mm. You know, did you ever feel any conflict about that? Well, reading historical documents is a straight, for, for my friends and colleagues mm -hmm. and former students who are here in the room will know, it's a strange mixture of tedium and euphoria. Most of the time, <laughs> we will all admit to you, it's terribly tedious and things are hard to read. You um, mentioned that in the book too. Yeah, right? they're, <laughs> they're, um, they're falling apart, they're dusty. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's difficult. It's hard on the eyes. You're trying to identify names and places. You're trying to string together clues. You can spend hours or days or weeks 
reading and not feeling like you're discovering anything. Um, but slowly, sometimes the euphoria comes in flashes. You read something beautiful. You read something revelatory. Um, you read something terrible. But a lot of the euphoria comes with that slow process of, of piecing clues together that only happens with the accrual of different papers, different voices, different collections, different perspectives that allow you to understand how people are re related, or you might understand one event from multiple vantage points. And so there is a sense that that, that daily tedium you hope, you have to have mm -hmm. faith, leads you towards this process of a greater revelation um, that will only unfold with time and, of course, has to be paired. Um, I always think that reading more doesn't necessarily produce a story. You then have to enter storytelling mode, yes. uh, which, is, which is your profession, and, and, and find out too, and yeah. how to tell a story. Right. Um, because um, a good work of history isn't a collection of facts at right. all. It is um, the building of, um, of a narrative arc. It is the development of character. It is um, thinking about drama in life's drama. And so even after all of that, um, those layers of reading are finished and the eye strain and the back breaking <laughs> and the inhalation of dust, et cetera, and so on, you still have to make that narrative journey as a writer. Let's talk now about Salonika itself. Yeah. And because um, I don't know, probably different levels of knowledge in the audience. But as Sarah mentioned, I guess around the turn of the century, like pre-World War I, 50% of Salonika is Jewish. Is there any other city like that in well, history? I mean, that's... There are, there are Jewish centers, um, especially of the Mediterranean and Middle East, that had majority or near majority Jewish populations. Um, probably some places that would shock people in the room, Essaouira, Morocco, uh, Oran, Algeria, you know, Salonika. There are other Jewish centers of the modern world whose numbers were far larger. Warsaw, three million. Now, it's perhaps easier to remember the sense of scale, the Warsaw. Um, but these places that were where you could walk the city streets and be more likely, at least in Salonika, more likely to hear a Jewish language than any other language. The numbers aren't as large, but this, the import to the Jewish world and the import of Jewish culture on that city and on non-Jews who lived there and, and on the state in which it was located was vast. Um, and so Salonika um, in the 19th century um, the, um, there are between 60 and 100,000 um, uh, Jews living in Salonika, and, and they're about half of the city's residents, and their percentage will slowly decline with time, but this is a place with dozens and dozens of synagogues. Um, 50, I think you wrote. Marking the diversity yeah. of the Sephardic community, and we might make the mistake of thinking that we know who Sephardim are, we might mm -hmm. think we know who Greek Jews are or Ottoman Jews, but it was a really very internally diverse community that spoke different languages, that had different migratory and diasporic histories, um, that had different religious rites practiced in these synagogues, um, as well as differences of class and gender and you know, family status and profession and so on and so forth. So this was um, a towering community of the Sephardic world, of incultural import. Um, it was an important Ottoman center and later Greek center. Um, and it is when we think about the modern Jewish world, if we don't think of these Mediterranean centers as among the most important Jewish centers of the modern world, we are really not seeing a full picture of what a modernity looked like for Jews. Why, why do you think that there's not this knowledge of this? Why, why are we so focused in America on, is it because most people are descendants from Poland, from Russia, because they're larger in numbers? Why are people surprised to hear about like the decimation of the Greek Jewish community, how vast it was? You know? Yeah, it's, it's a, actually, I think, quite a complicated question. I think demographics are, provide some answers, that the majority of Jews in this country are of Ashkenazi background. And for many of those Jews, certainly among the immigrant generation, um, they wouldn't necessarily have known of Sephardic communities. In certain cities, one might, in Seattle, in Los Angeles, in New York. Um, but I think that by now, the issues are actually a bit, go beyond demography. Um, 
I think that the there is a tendency among um, centers that educate students in Jewish studies, museums that create displays of Jewish culture, Jewish history, um, pop, mainstream Jewish publications that write about Jewish politics and Jewish culture. There is a tendency across these different facets of the modern Jewish world to um, to privilege and present as the, as the norm Ashkenazi Jewish stories. And I can think of a lot of um, books, academic and popular books, that tell the arc of an Ashkenazi Jewish family in the way that I was interested in telling the arc of a Sephardic Jewish family. But there really isn't any, there had been no such book for the Sephardic world. I can think of works of mm -hmm. fiction. Um, mm -hmm. Mr. Mani might be an example of a work of fiction that seeks yes. to do that task. Um, so, um, you know, as an academic, I also see that in the university world, I'm sure this is true for people in the room who might think back to their own studies, might have children, grandchildren in studies. There are many places one can study, for example, Holocaust history, which is something that I teach at UCLA and have taught for, um, for two decades, where you would receive a syllabus and looking through that syllabus, sitting through that class, you would never know that Sephardic Jews perished in the Holocaust, and not just perished, but that this community, Salonika, had um, among the very highest rates of annihilation of any community in all of Europe. Or one might not know, looking at that same, same syllabus, one might not know that um, North Africa was a crucial site of internment and race laws and spoliation of the Second World War. So there is, I think, a kind of collective irresponsibility, mm. I have to say, that this continues to perpetuate itself, even though I and many of my colleagues and friends have provided um, students and scholars um, really the resources they need to rethink the story. Mm -hmm. um, so this was my attempt to, to, through a family history, to provide a story which I think is both um, really accessible because it is so essentially Jewish, mm -hmm. but also is uniquely Sephardic. And to use that family to um, help provide, a, a, shine a light on the diversity of modern Jewish culture. And not only, I mean, I think it shines a light, it really it's a great way to learn the history of that time. And so for me, it was just so striking at the turn of the century as we're nearing World War I and we're nearing the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, this 400 year old empire, mm -hmm. that, you're, that at that moment, the Jews in Salonika felt so safe mm -hmm. and so happy and so well treated under the Ottoman Empire. And the contrast with that, once it becomes a Greek Christian country, talk about what they went yeah. through, the, the right. collapse of the Ottoman Empire, their own beginning of their own collapse. Yeah, yeah it's, it's fascinating. I mean, this community, the Sephardic community of Southeastern Europe, lives under Ottoman rule for 500 years. Um, they have a relationship to the biblical and mythic land of Israel. They have a, a, a symbolic relationship and a religious one and a ritualistic one. They also have a symbolic and ritual relationship to, to Spain, to Sepharad, to Iberia. But really, they are Ottomans. 500 years, they are Ottomans, this entire community. I mean, there were also Sephardic Jews who went um, to other parts of Europe and to North Africa. But this community is, is Ottoman for 500 years. And through those 500 years, they are um, exceptionally well integrated into an Ottoman social fabric. And um, the empire existed in such a way that uh, religious tolerance for most of its lifespan, not for all of its lifespan, for most of its lifespan, um, tolerance of diversity, I don't mean um, a kind of democracy, but tolerance of diversity was built into the legal and political uh, and sort of societal structure. And so they are, uh, they view themselves as Ottoman. They are quintessential Ottomans. And this only becomes actually more apparent to them in the 19th century, a time when Jews in Eastern Europe and Western Europe and in the Ottoman lands are getting politicized. Mm -hmm. um, there are many in this part of the world and in this family, the Levy family, who will reject Zionism for a particular reason. And they, many of them reject Zionism because they are Ottoman patriots and they don't want to support a movement that threatens their beloved empire, 
with secession, that is to say with the creation of a Jewish land in Ottoman controlled Palestine. So it's a, it's a marker of how they really um, perceive themselves and they are perceived as, as instrumental to this, um, this cultural world. And certainly if we think of a place like Salonika, but the same would be actually true of Istanbul or Izmir or Edirne or other places, um, Jews were essential to the cultural fabric of the place. And it's, it's striking that one of Saadi's sons actually takes a Turkish name, right? Yeah, he becomes right. Daoud Effendi. And because and he gets a he gets a, a gift from the Sultan, right? I mean, right. It's a, he undertakes a remarkable journey of his own. I mean, he's um, Saadi, the memoirist, was um, kind of an iconoclast. Um, he was also a very talented musician, a singer, and a composer. He was also um, a newspaper editor and writer and a printer. And um, he writes a memoir in large part because he has annoyed the rabbinical establishment of Salonika by um, airing in his newspapers political views that are unseemly to the rabbinical establishment. And he is excommunicated by the writ of Kherem, by the Jewish writ of excommunication. It's quite a scene. It's quite a scene. Did you see Game of a, Thrones? How many people watch Game of Thrones? It's pretty much when Game of Thrones. running through the, yeah, te- you know, right. um, what's her name is? Cersei? Being chased. It's often been compared to Game of Thrones. Oh, it has? No, never. No, no. never. <laughs> Not once. But anyway. That's what I thought. Okay, okay. <laughs> but I like it, but I'll go with it's it. It's intense. Right, They're it being is. chased through the They're town. They're being chased. They're being chased. Yeah, no. um, but his, <laughs> his sons follow him into the family business of printing, but one of them um, is um, becomes a, a, a bureaucrat for the Ottomans. It represents the Ottoman state as a passport bureau and in time will become um, chancellor of the Jewish community of Salonika. And whether that position through the transition from Ottoman rule to Greek rule, which happens after the Balkan Wars of 1911 to 1912. And so he becomes one of the most important figures in um, first Ottoman and then Greek Salonika. And um, extraordinarily, this man who uh, was a, uh, not only a dignitary under the Ottomans, and as you said, when the Sultan at one point visits his hometown, he's awarded diamond cufflinks personally by the Sultan uh, because he's considered the local dignitary, he will breathe his last breath in Auschwitz, which shows you the extraordinary compressed drama that this family underwent. Right, such a short period. In such a short period. So you mentioned that Dawood Effendi worked in a passport office. Yeah. So I find it extreme. And you have a whole other book about the passports. Yes. How Jews of this time took out an insurance policy of mm-hmm. sorts by getting a passport from another country, like Portugal. Talk about right. that. Yeah, so it is something that I um, dedicated a whole other book to. Um, but in this family, something that I wrote about in a, a little bit more conceptually became very vivid and real and intimate. Um, At the moment, I was describing a moment ago of the Balkan Wars, um, Jews realize that their city will likely no longer be Ottoman. And they don't yet know who will be the conquering power. Will it be Bulgaria? Will it be Greece? Might it end up being an international city, which some of them dream of? Could it, as some others dream, become a Jewish city with a Jewish mayor? Not as crazy as it would seem, given that it's still majority Mm -hmm. Jewish, um, or plurality, actually, at that point. Um, But at this time of uncertainty, there's a lot of panic in the Jewish community, because for the most part, this community was loyal to the Ottomans. And they think about the empire falling apart with a lot of trepidation. They don't, mostly, they don't want to become Greek. They don't want to become Bulgarian because what they have seen, this is 1911, 1912, they look around the Balkans, they look around the Middle East, and what they have seen is that what happens with the rise of nations and nation states, there's a rise in anti-Semitism. And what happens with the rise of nations and nation states, nation states want to um, homogenize their populations and tend to squeeze Jews out. Jews get the squeeze, so they're afraid. And history will prove their fear well-founded, because that is actually what happens. But at that moment of anxiety, they make different choices. They take agency over their lives. Some emigrate. That's one choice. Um, Some stay, stick it out, uh, and become nationals of whatever state they reside in. Um, Some of them 
will pursue this course and go to a consulate in their city and seek a foreign passport, Portuguese or Spanish or Austro-Hungarian or British or French. Um, one question is why the states want to do this, but I'm going to leave that question aside. But the Jews want to do it because they think it can't hurt and it might help. Why, do, why does anyone do anything, right? It can't hurt and it might help. It might help get your son out of military service or get yourself out of middle, military service. It might help get you out of taxes. Um, it, it can serve a variety of purposes. And so um, this family includes family members who pursue this course mm -hmm. in different directions. Some become Portuguese, some become French, et cetera, and so on. Those papers become definitive for the family members and in some cases end up um, saving them from deportation at the hands of the Nazis during the Second World War. But even before that point, they can have the effect of shaping lives, of changing the course of your life, which is actually more than anyone ever could have realized at the time. Right, they didn't know that whether you have this passport and you're living in France is gonna actually mean that you survive exactly. like, that deportation. It's, it's quite gripping when you get to it. You talked about how once the Greeks, once it becomes Greece, um, there's restrictions that happen, that life becomes harder for the Jews. And one mm -hmm. of the things that happens, you write, is that the Greeks deem that Sunday is a mandatory day of rest. Mm -hmm. So the Jews are faced with a choice now. What are we going to do, lose Saturday and Sunday? Are we going to abandon religion? Reductions, uh, talk about the Jewish cemetery and what happens. I mean, just how, give a sense of just how their fears were so well-founded. What happened? Well, the Jewish cemetery of Salonika is uh, you know, extraordinary has an extraordinary history, and it's been written about quite wonderfully by my friend and colleague Devin Narr uh, from a different perspective. Here I try to tell the history of the cemetery th by thinking about what it meant for the family. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things they experience is, is watching with fear as the municipality and the state eye this land covetously. It's right in the middle of the city. Today, what sits on that land, but the University of Thessaloniki, um, it was raised during the Second World War by the Greek municipality, um, but at the uh, sanction of the Nazi powers. Um, but through this book, the cemetery is almost a character, actually. Mm -hmm. it, is the, it is visited, um, graves are visited, uh, photographs are taken, um, rituals are performed. It is the last place family members will go before emigrating abroad. Um, people will return at various points to visit tombs. And then during the horrors of the Second World War, uh, as we can all imagine, there will be people, there will be emigres who are desperate to find out what has happened to the cemetery, what has happened to their deported loved ones, can bodies this is before full knowledge of the trauma of the Holocaust is known. Can bodies be reclaimed? Can they be brought back to the cemetery for a proper burial? Not realizing um, that the cemetery has been destroyed. So it, it's almost, aside from the family, I really think the cemetery and the city pair. It's a touchstone, as, it really yeah, is. It is. Throughout, you go, mm -hmm. I mean, it's beautiful scenes. I mean, it was, the, I think you wrote the largest Jewish cemetery in yes. Europe, 350,000 graves. The tombstones became p parts of the road. You have a picture of Saadi's tombstone is now somewhere else. It was like yes, it was after it was dismantled in the course of the Second World War. The stones were reused um, in all sorts of ways that were both horrific and banal. I mean, mm -hmm. they are horrific, but they were also in a strange way banal. They were certainly used to, to build churches and expand mm -hmm. courtyards of churches. They were used to build a swimming pool for the, the Nazis. They were, but they were also used in walkways, in, mm -hmm. in house foundations. And to this day, one can still see them scattered around the city. And, and it was in the immediate aftermath of the war. I don't really write about this, but mm -hmm. If you were a student at the new University of Thessaloniki in the city, you could still walk through the campus and bones would be surfacing because it was a newly created site on the soil of an ancient cemetery. Um, mm -hmm. But Saadi's tombstone was found. Um, there is a project to identify these stones and unearth them 
photograph and document them and bring them to the Jewish Museum mm -hmm. uh, where they can be displayed and protected. And one of those stones found in a walkway on a hill above the city was Saadi's grave. And it, today, if you visit the museum, the Jewish Museum in Thessaloniki, it is on display. You can see it there. Uh, this actually happened in the course of my writing. Really? That's so it shows recent, you yeah. how... Um, it's very contemporary issues. It is. Even. And history sort of keeps unearthing itself in this dramatic place. You know, I mean, the cemetery story is like a long one. It took us a little past what was really the critical crisis for this community. So after the Balkan Wars, we, we got through 1912, 1913, and then 1917 happens. And I'm not talking about World War One. I'm talking about a massive fire yes. that engulfs the entire city. Could you read to us a oh, little sure. bit? Oh, I think it's um, just about this fire to give people a sense. It's I think it's on page 69 where this this fire erupts and how it... On, on top of everything else the Jewish community is dealing with, now this happens. Yeah, so this is in a, a chapter called Esther, and, and I will explain that there is a compressed period of time of such drama for the community. The First World War, during which Salonika is a site of Allied encampment and also a site of massive refugees coming through and being stationed there. Um, that has followed on the heels of the Balkan Wars, and the, the changing political landscape of the city and region. And then in 1917, when the war, First World War is still um, raging, there is a fire. And that's what this chapter, Esther, describes. And I'll read it, I'll read uh, a, a page or so, two pages from this. One month after Greece entered the First World War on the side of the Allies, on a hot, windy August afternoon in 1917, the Salem family was enjoying a restful Sabbath in the delightful suburb of Salonika, where Fortune and Asher, the parents of Esther, had settled some decades earlier. Las Campanas was known for its grand vistas, and the Salem home offered a generous view of Salonika's red tile roofs, the bay, and Mount Olympus beyond. On this particular August day, Esther's father's enjoyment of the view was marred by the sight of flames in the distance. He called the family to come quickly. I went to look, wrote Esther in a letter to her brother Jacques, and indeed a large part of the city appeared to have fallen prey to the flames. After this, we couldn't stop watching the fire. We wanted to pull ourselves away, but as if magnetized, we were drawn to the small corner of the terrace on the water where we saw the whole city. Esther's brother Carsa arrived from town frantic. A newly renamed Venezuela Street where the family business was located had burned to the ground. Oh, the images that I have seen, Carsa sobbed. Children, women, all fleeing, and despite the horror, the city is calm. The exodus is happening in a mournful, heavy silence. A woman gave birth on the pavement. People surrounded her as she shrieked, I am broken. Papa, go and see what must be done. In a panic, Asher rushed out, taking the keys to his store and leaving his wife, Fortune, and the children at home. As the hours passed, Esther and her family watched Red Cross and British trucks race by. Among the fleeing masses, the so-called, the quote, parade of ghosts that Esther saw stumble by the home was a number of family members, including her cousin Eleanor, Dauta Fendi's daughter, and her husband and children. Eleanor's family and a good number of strangers took shelter with the Salems. The garden, courtyard, and house were quickly transformed into a makeshift refuge as closets were emptied to provide clean clothes and sheets for the victims. At last, Esther's father returned, Quote, his eyes swollen in his sockets and very pale, his face pale as candle wax. Unable to save the family store, Asher managed to rescue only a handful of account books before fleeing to the smoky streets. Despite the chaos, he had located his father and mother-in-law, Dauta Fendi and Vida, and their son Emmanuel. As the night wore on, the flames spread. Even the sea was burning, dotted with blazing sailboats. Quote, in vain did I close my eyes in the dark, Esther wrote later for my imprinted retinas still saw the burning ships on the trembling sea. Emanating from a neighborhood adjacent to the crowded port known to Salonika's Jews as Agua Nueva, New Water, the fire wrought catastrophic damage in the city's historic Jewish quarter, in the commercial district and in the port where most of the city's Jews lived and worked. When the fire began, the movie theaters were packed and an Italian marching band was performing in Liberty Square. As the flames spread, the French military strategically bombed a number of buildings, including the city's new Talmud Torah, hoping to arrest the fire's course. The efforts were futile. The fire only grew in intensity. 
ultimately raging for 30 hours and covering a square kilometer thick with urban life. 32 synagogues burned, along with nine rabbinical libraries, 600 Torah scrolls, and eight Jewish schools. Though no deaths were recorded, 50,000 Jews were left homeless, along with 10,000 15, along with 10,000 Muslim residents of the city and somewhere between 10,000 and 15,000 Christians. The damage was estimated at a billion French francs, 75% of which was Jewish owned. The city already transformed into a wartime refugee hub became a smoldering landscape of displacement overnight. Do they know what caused the, what triggered it? Um, it was said at the time that it was a, a kitchen fire. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't an arson thing. I mean, given that it was 75% Jewish. It is not Jewish. believed to be arson. Yeah, I was just right. curious. So they have this trauma. A lot of people leave after yes. this, right? Mm -hmm. Some stay. The unfortunate ones, in a way, stay, right? Because they're going to end up being taken by the Nazis. So let's just jump ahead now to World War II. And many of, of the Greek Jewish community had gone to Paris, right? And so you talk about the deportation in November 1942 of yes. Greek Jews in Paris, many of whom were from Salonika. The Nazis actually decided to round up this particular Greek population in Paris, right? Yes, it's an amazing story. And I should say first that there are many who emigrate yes. after the fire, but those who stay I don't think we can say that they were foolish. You know, um, history historians hindsight is twenty twenty. Yeah. But Not no foolish, one can see the yeah. can see the future. Unfortunate. Um, they yeah. did, it is true, enter a period of poverty and hardship and a restriction of options. And yet I think none could imagine that in a generation their community would be decimated. So the the Levy family um, has emigres in various places. There is a branch in Manchester. There is, as I mentioned, a, a branch in Rio. The biggest branch is in Paris. And um, this, these Jews in this family and many other Sephardic Jews went to Paris for, for a set of reasons, um, partly because many had acquired fluency in French because they were educated in schools of a Franco-Jewish philanthropy that was known as the Alliance Israelite Universelle. So they arrived with a, a, a near native mastery of French. But they also went because this was a place of opportunity and potential economic ascension. So there are many cousins in Paris and aunts and uncles in Paris. And um, as the deportations, well, I should say, um, as the Nazi and the, as the German army and the SS enters Paris, many residents, Jewish residents of Paris flee. Especially if you are not native born, you understand that it is a vulnerable status to occupy. That is to say, to be a refugee or to be a recent immigrant without a network, without a, a fixed community. And especially if you're carrying a foreign passport, um, and especially all the more if you're carrying a foreign passport that will be an enemy to the state that occupies you. So many, many flee, including members of the family, but there are some who stay. And um, in November, as you say, there is a rigorous sweep by the SS working with the French police. And it's really important to emphasize that the French police take an active role in this, um, as they do through the deportations, to uh, identify um, Jews of Salonican origin in the city and to round them up in, in the course of a single night, November 4th to 5th, and to send them to um, Drancy, which is a um, temporary internment ca camp on the outskirts of Paris. Um, some will be there hours, some will be there mere days, but from Drancy, they will be sent um, to Auschwitz. Uh, it happens that um, two members of this family are stopped at a way station on their way to the death camp. And uh, it is a fluke that is described in the book, but they are taken off and they alone of all of those who are deported from Paris will be sent to a labor camp. And of that, those two, they are brothers, one will survive. And that will be the only member of the family to be deported to the camps of the East, or the labor camps of the East, who will, in the end, return alive. And this is out of scores of members of the family who will be deported from Salonika and Paris, especially, in the course of the war. 
So I think you describe it as those are like around the 1,416 Greek Jews who are mm-hmm. deported from Paris. But then we have the major deportations from Salonika during 1943, a couple month period, yes. it seems, right? right. 48,533 Jews who were sent on an eight day trip from Salonika to Auschwitz. Um, I don't know if you want to read about that period at all, or it's, I think, on sure. page uh, 181. Thank so you. This trauma and the time, obviously. This is. Okay, so this is in a chapter called Eleanor. Um, Eleanor, I mentioned earlier, she is the daughter of Daoud Effendi, who was the um, Ottoman passport official who became the head of the Jewish community of Salonika. Eleanor. The Nazis deported the extended Levy family from Salonika to Auschwitz in stages. The journey took roughly six days in freight cars jammed with more than 70 people each. Provisions, light, and air were all negligible. Prisoners wailed from sickness, pain, hunger, thirst, and fear. Some died en route, forcing the living to remain pressed against the dead for hours at a time. Eleanor's father, Daoud Effendi, made this terrifying journey in his 81st year. Quote, I followed your father until the last minute, that is to say, through the concentration camp, she means ghetto, of Salonika, wrote Julie Hassan Sarfati to her cousin Leon in a letter sent to Rio from post-war Greece. I'll continue to quote from her letter. The news that I heard from several survivors who left in the same convoy and were trapped in the same train to Poland is that your father and his brother-in-law died in the first week in the gas chamber since, because of their age, they could not be used for forced labor. Julie pressed other survivors for the precise dates of Daoud Effendi's death, but none could remember with certainty. Quote, life in camp was a veritable hell, she wrote, and deduced that after leaving Salonika in mid-April 1943, Leon's father must have died within the first two weeks of May. Eleanor's son, Solomon, quote, succumbed several months later after being used for experimental work, but he died a natural death, reported Julie. This could mean that Solomon was subjected to medical experiments, as were other Salonican deportees, or that he was inducted into the Sonderkommando, as were other Greek-Jewish veterans of the Greek-Italian War. Quote, of the women in the family, no one has told me anything, Julie continued. It seems that their convoy had no survivors. With his sister, Dudun Molho, Daoud Effendi belonged to the oldest generation of the Levy family to perish in Auschwitz. His daughter, Eleanor, was murdered there, too, as were, as were her husband, Abram, and their three children, Allegra, Solomon, and Etty. The extended families of Abram and of Etty's husband, Joseph Menasseh, were also among the annihilated, as were Abram and Joseph themselves. The youngest in the family to be killed was Etty and Joseph's four-year-old daughter, Lenora Menasseh, known to the family by her two pet names, Nora and Nimica. Eleanor's father, Daoud Effendi, was born in 1863, when Salonika was Ottoman, when his father, Saadi, could provoke the, religi- the rabbinical establishment with the incendiary tools of a printing press and a violin. His great-granddaughter, Lenora, was born in 1939, the year the Second World War began. The two bookended four generations, yet they breathed their last breaths in the same claustrophobic space in rural Poland, inhaling a poison invented to eradicate vermin in a chamber designed by German engineers. So the, the woman who you mentioned, Julie Hasson, who writes mm-hmm. the letter to Leon about Daoud Effendi, she survives. And she she's one of what you call the Bergen-Belsen survivors. And I don't know how much you want to get into the story. Maybe we don't have a lot of time to talk right. about Vital. Um, but she, the sister of a key character in the book. Mm-hmm. And talk about the very few who do come back and the ones who come from Bergen-Belsen versus the ones who survived Auschwitz and what happens there. Well, okay, so there is... Um, a, um, the broadest strokes, I guess, because the Vital story, I think, is... Yes, yeah, so um, as I describe in the book, you know, I expected to find trauma when I mm. reached the chapter of the Second World War because with the rates of annihilation being as high as they were for this community, it was unimaginable that it would be avoided, of course. But there is um, an additional trauma that I discovered in um, by reading not only family papers, actually mostly by reading other documents. And I don't want to reveal too much about this, and it's a painful story, but it is the story um, of a cousin who um, uh, abetted the Nazi deportation of the Jews of Europe as a head of the Jewish police of Salonika, and after the war is tried and ultimately executed for complicity with the Nazis 
during the war. His name is Vital, and his sister is Julie. Most of the Jews of Salonika are deported to Auschwitz. A very small number, family members of the Jewish police, and also Jews who held Spanish and Portuguese passports from precisely that legal twist I talked about earlier, they are not deported to Auschwitz for the most part. They are sent to Bergen-Belsen and their rates of survival are higher. After the war, Salonika is just in shambles. Um, Greece in general and Salonika in particular has been decimated by poverty, by the violence. Those who return, which is a very, very small fraction of, of those who are deported, are, you can imagine, in a traumatized state and starving and ill and bereft of family and devoured by grief. But there are those who have survived in hiding. There are those who return from the death camps. There are those who return from labor camps. And there are those who return from Bergen-Belsen. And it is an incredibly painful a chapter of this story that in the immediate aftermath of the war, within the survivor community, there is a lot of suspicion um, among these groups. Um, those who survive in hiding um, at first do not believe the accounts of those who return from the death camps. They are unimaginable. Um, those who fought with the partisans who, who return are angry at those who hid. And on and on and on, there are layers and layers, and there is tremendous acrimony directed at those who were part of the Bergen-Belsen transport, because they are viewed as the families, family members of those who were complicit in um, abetting the Nazi crimes, and because they are viewed to have somehow been given the easy pass. Julie is among this population. On top of the fact of being a Bergen-Belsen survivor, she's also the sister of a ultimately convicted, ultimately executed war criminal. And so one of, I find her one of the most uh, poignant figures yeah, too. in so this book. And she that. returns and must um, reinvent herself and find her way um, through this grief and trauma and the devastation of her community and her family. So I'm gonna turn it over to questions in just a moment. I want to give Sarah an opportunity to just read briefly before we go to questions about mm. the descendants on page 245. But Sarah, I want to ask one final question of yes. my own before you, you talk about your conversations with the, the current generation. As a writer, as a historian, um, you know, what was left of the Sephardic family was largely this correspondence and the papers, mm -hmm. and you had to rely on these, on these materials. How do you think the book would have been different if you could have actually interviewed these people in real, like if they were still living somehow, you know, obviously you can't, or if you had been there to report on it in real time? Mm -hmm. Do you think you would have gotten a more honest account from in-person interviews, or do you think letters inherently are somehow more honest? Well, I'm incredibly indebted to the family descendants, some of whom I'm very happy to say are in this room, mm -hmm. um, for opening their homes, sharing their materials, really trusting me with this mm -hmm. endeavor. And those relationships, the insights they provided were absolutely instrumental mm -hmm. for my understanding, first of all, for my looking at these documents, but then also understanding them in a human way and thinking not only about the documents as a window to the past, mm -hmm. but also thinking about what family papers mean to families who continue to treasure them, in some cases, long after they even can read the languages in which they're written. Mm -hmm. Not in every case, but in some cases. Um, you know, historians are find it much easier to deal with dead people, <laughs> typically by profession, because that's what we're used to doing. Um, we don't necessarily have your training of, of interviewing, of um, assessing. I mean, there are some people who work with oral history, of course. But um, so it's, um, it's a kind of counterfactual I almost can't fathom what, what would happen. But I think what's, what I leave this book thinking and maybe, in fact, this actually serves as a better ending point than, than a reading. What I leave this book thinking is that um, this family history, like all family histories, it's, it can, it's never fully told. Because there are always stories you miss. Mm -hmm. There are doors that are closed to you. There are documents you didn't unearth. There might be something important you didn't understand. There might be secrets that have been harbored that it will take a future historian to tell. 
Um, so part of the conclusion of, of family papers is to think about um, family history as this curiously ongoing endeavor with echoes of the past continuing to ring in the present. And will we have more mm. a more richer history for, because we have so much digitized now or a less rich history because there's no longer, like I said in the beginning, the, the suitcases of yeah, papers? Yeah, it's something I also thought about a lot. I think today we generate a lot for future historians to look at the poor future historians, the tweets, the Instagrams, yeah. you know, the texts, no. the WhatsApp texts, the, you know, I mean, a good, the <laughs> TikTok, the God, God only knows. Um, but I believe after spending a lot of years inhabiting this family and inhabiting this family's letters, I believe that there is something we have lost along with the art of letter writing. There is something different to be found in a letter that is written over time takes a long time to journey to its destination, uh, sometimes doesn't reach it at all, um, that is labored over, that is edited, written over days, that is treasured when it arrives, that is preserved lovingly, sometimes with fear, but sometimes lovingly. Um, and there's something in that art and the relationships it produces and the intimacies it produces, even the fighting that it could engender, there's something different about letters. Mm -hmm. And I think that the future historian will have a very different view of the way words connect people in, in our time than I was able to understand what papers meant to this family in their time. Okay, wonderful. So now we'll have time for a few questions. I think, Great. Stephanie, there's going to be a mic. Um, so raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question and maybe identify yourself. Start over here. Stephanie's going to be calling on people. Okay. Fourth. Or is over there. First question. Okay. You mentioned there was quite a bit of diversity in yeah. the Jewish community in Salonika. Can you give some examples of that, please? Sure. Um, so there was a community of Jews that lived in this area before the exiles from Iberia arrived, known as Romaniot, Greek Jews. Janine's family, we think, is probably a member of that community. There were Sephardic Jews who came from what is now Spain and Portugal, then medieval Liberia. There were Ashkenazi Jews, including Jews from Italy. There was a distinct community of Jews who, who, who were Sephardic and also were Italian, but particularly identified with the city of Livorno, who continued to be called Livornese Jews or by other names. Then there were mixtures of communities. I'm not even giving you the full list, but mm -hmm. there were travelers and there were merchants and there were consular agents and including all Jews. So this was really an entrepot, a place through which people came and went. And of those who settled there, there were so many synagogues, partly because there were so many sub-Jewish communities who wanted to practice with a community and according to their own right. Um, so over time, Salonican, the Salonican Jewish community came to be understood as Sephardic, but it really wasn't homogenous. It really wasn't ever only or essentially Sephardic. It was always internally diverse, as was this family too, which included um, disparate strands that came together to produce a family that, that really towered over the world of Judeo-Spanish letters, but whose history was actually internally diverse. Next question on your left. Okay. Hi. Hi. My family name is Baruch and Kochamiro. We are Romanio Jews yeah. on my father's side. <laughs> and um, I am told that at one point my grandfather's family lived in mm -hmm. uh, Saloniki. And so I was, before you made that comment, I was going to ask you about. Um, what you might have learned as far as the interactions between those two groups. And my my grandmother, who we called Nona, used to talk about, uh, they're from Yanina, my grandmother's. Hi. My grandmother, too. Well, I have to speak. There was Naftali. We'll talk about it later, yeah. Yeah, I know the Naftali's <laughs> in the Bronx. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, same. Oh, God. <laughs> they all lived in the same buildings, you see, but in New York. But anyway, um, <laughs> but just that she used to talk about the cultural differences between the uh, Romaniote and the mm. Sephardic Jews, and she, she used to say they called us hillybillies. Mm. <laughs> so I'm just curious if you have any um, contact with that. 
Oh, and one last thing. Um, I have with me a book called The Jews of Janina, written by Ray Dalvin, who is my grandmother's cousin, um, and a reference list of, um, that might be of interest from the Kahila Kadosha uh, Museum and, yeah. and Synagogue in New York Wonderful. City. Thank you. Um, like any community, like any Jewish community the world over, um, really, in the modern world, certainly, you know, there are, there are layers within layers and there are spheres within spheres and there is difference and there are sub-communities. Um, so the, over time, um, the Romani, many Romaniot Jews came to be, this is a word that my colleague Aaron Rodriguez uses, came to be Judeo-Hispanicized. That is, they came to take on Ladino, as did other members of other Jewish communities in this region. And many of them over time came to think of themselves as Sephardic, although from a historian's perspective, originally their family trees came you know, from different directions. So there was overlap. There, was, there were families that married one another, um, Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Romaniot, et cetera, and so on. Um, but for many families, that sense of heritage remained very important and would be transmitted and would be manifest in various choices from the name you might give your child to certain culinary traditions, um, perhaps to religious rites or traditions. So um, there's a melding and a mixing, but, there is, but there's also this very complicated maintenance of, um, of a sense of difference. Um, throughout your book, it seems that the Levy family scattered in many, many places, but with a very narrow fragment mm -hmm. in Israel. And throughout the history, a very limited uh, involvement mm -hmm. with either the cause of Zionism as it began in the century, Palestine, and ultimately Israel, is... Um, I wonder if you could comment, is that unique to the Levy family? Would you uh, find that that's true generally through the Sephardi community? What are your comments yeah, on that? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. It's a really important question. So there were communities in the Sephardic cultural world who came to be staunch Zionists. And the best example is the Bulgarian Jewish community um, that has very high rates of survival during the Second World War, partly because of the protection of the Bulgarian state. And uh, among that survivor community, um, this very high rate of survivors will mostly go to Palestine or if they go after 48 to Israel. Um, and among other communities, I would say there are individuals, there are families for whom Zionism was compelling and important after 1908, uh, when censorship is lifted, a greater diversity of expression is allowed. So um, there are certainly families, including my own, who had, when the family emigrated from Southeastern Europe, um, one would go to Paris, one would go to New York, one would go to Jerusalem, for example. That was true of my family. Um, th this family was a little bit different. Um, there were some kind of shoestring relations who went to Palestine or later to Israel. But mostly they did not. And I've thought a lot about why they didn't. And it's very hard to know why people don't make the choices that they don't pursue. It's extremely hard to document that. But what I can say is that debates about Zionism and debates about the validity of the state of Israel, as you know from the book, run through the family dating back to the first years of the 20th century when they were already debating the value of Zionism in the Ladino and French press of Salonika. And they continue to have that debate publicly and with each other over and over and over again through the years. And after 1948, when the state is, is indeed declared, there are two family members who are arguing, you know, is Zionism, is, is Zionism good for the Jews? Is the state good for the Jews? And they have differing opinions, which I think can be explained by various reasons why they do have various opinions. But it is possible. I can hypothesize why. I, I can't say for sure it is true. But I can hypothesize that for this family, 
because they were editors and writers um, and very proud citizens of the Ottoman world, they held on to an older tradition of thinking that there was a risk that Zionism expressed disloyalty to the empire. Now, obviously, this ceases to be true after the empire doesn't exist anymore. So um, although it lingers, it lingers, curiously enough. It does, it does continue to be true. But there are many members of the family who became Zionist after 48 when they weren't before. And their children and their grandchildren will have a different relationship and their great grandchildren to the state. So Zionism, had my story continued to go forward in time, I think that Zionism and a relationship to state would have emerged as a more powerful force. Um, I start to see it in the 1960s. I start to see them visiting and going. Um, but my story begins to fade out a bit um, and, and really it's like deflate into the 1970s. But, there, but it is a fascinating aspect of the Sephardic story that you can write this history and not have Zionism be central because it was a debate, but it wasn't their politic of choice. Um, although I will say that Salonika was heralded by certain important um, Zionist uh, philosophers and um, theoreticians. They were very excited by Salonika because it was the great working class Jewish center of the Mediterranean. And they saw in Salonika a model, for example, for what Tel Aviv could be. Look at all the Jewish stevivores, mm -hmm. you know, this is what we will build. Thank you. Okay, hi. One of the things that struck me was the size of the uh, archive that you found in Rio de Janeiro. Uh -huh. And it seems that the family had a lot of awareness of its own importance and greatness as a great family with a great story. Um, can you say something about the family's own sense of its own status and importance? That seems to be a strong element of the family itself. I think it is. I mean, I think that across the branches of the family, one of the things that struck me, there's a photograph, um, not on the cover of this book, but on the cover of the memoir that I started out with that I published some years ago, Saadi's memoir. There's a photograph. The photograph is from the 19th century, and it shows Saadi and one of his wives. Many of the places I traveled, the family had this very photograph hanging on the wall. It was important to them. The same one, whether it was Montreal you know, or, or Manchester or play, points in between. Um, I do think that the legacy of the family was handed down. The family continues to understand that they came from a family of, of import. But of course, with every passing generation, the, the sense of this gets more and more ephemeral. So one might have um, a certain generation living today who knew their grandparents. And um, their, their grandparents' letters mattered to them because they were intimate to them. Their children, so let's say you might have somebody in their late 50s or 60s today who knew their grandparents. And again, this is something I'm finding with branches of family all over the world. Um, there's an intimacy with that history that the next generation and the generation of that can't quite grasp. And again, because of the languages required, to read these papers, with every successive generation, it's more and more unlikely um, that they can read the very papers that the family holds. So I think there is a sense that um, descendants of this family continue to treasure it. Of course, it's varied by person, and some people knew a lot more than others. That's human nature. Um, but I also see the further they get from that original world of the emigre, um, who had their own stories to tell, the more like opaque that history be would become. I think we have time for just one more. And I just want to remind everybody that uh, Sarah is going to be signing right after the program in the atrium. So stick around for that. Last question. Yeah, I have a comment on your uh, answer before about Jews not going to Palestine. If you read uh, the late Ben Sion Maimon in La Boz, you know where I mean La Boz. He was saying that the Jews were forbidden, if not, well, the scourge are not outright forbidden by the Sultan to go there because he knew what would happen if the Jews went to Palestine. 
he'd have an uproar in his hand from the Arabs. Well, there is a debate, this is in the Ladino press, there is a debate in the Ladino press and in the French press among this community. What's the politic of choice? Should it be socialism? Should it be Zionism? Should it be Ottomanism? Um, should we throw ourselves into the nationalism of the state with which, you know, of which we are now a part after the Ottoman state disappears? There's a constant debate. And any Ladino or French newspaper or Hebrew newspaper that you read in the period, you feel that debate surfacing because it was very live for these people. Um, and it, I, I mentioned after the Young Turk revolt, it becomes more animate because censorship is lifted. Um, so it is always a question and a conversation for these communities. But we do find that although there is a Zionist movement, there's a, a Hebraist movement, there is certainly different forms of Zionist fealty, religious, political, territorial, etc. cetera. Um, it's not quite the mirror to the Ashkenazi world. It's a different manifestation. And again, one has to look place by place to see how popular these movements are. But really, this is also true across the Middle East, as well as the Mediterranean, the Aegean, that it, um, it always has its fans, but it doesn't become a mass movement for this community. Um, I would say, especially after 1908 through the 30s, you can find that. Um, well, no, it's it's after the Young Turk revolt, so it's um, once censor, once the censor lifts their hand. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I hope you all enjoyed the evening. Please join me in thanking Sarah Stein. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you. Lovely.